Welcome to What's in My Drawers Golf Talk, Jim McCleary. And we say what's in my drawers because old club makers are tremendous pack rats. And I'm no different. And I have something from the drawer to show you today. We're going to go with that. And it is 419. How about that? I got that one right today, I think. And we have a lot to cover. There was a lot going on in the world of golf, plus a lot going on in the McGolf shop. So let's get to it. Number one, let's talk about what I was putting together. I have a set of left-handed D9s. How about that? Left-handed D9s with some KBS Tour 90s. I know it's upside down. And some Align grips. Left-handed. That was a set of irons. And we went with a, a D9 hybrid to finish out the set. Put a little chrome accent on that guy so it would look pretty good. With an Acra. An Acra hybrid. A 62 gram in the M3 with the same grip. The cool part about this is it's going to Canada. It's so going to Canada. Lefty going to Canada. That should be of no surprise for lefties, but uh, we've been sending quite a bit of stuff in the last two weeks up to Canada. And uh, I like how they turned out, so I'm pretty happy with that. And here's one you normally don't see me talking about, but uh, custom ordered one of those. The Apex DCB, the DCB stands for deep cavity back, and it has a little bit more offset than the standard DCB, or I'm sorry, than the standard Apex has. A slightly wider sole, right? Slightly wider sole, comes in the same, uh, same loft angles as the other ones do, but just a little bit more for those folks that need just a little bit more playability, just want to get it out there a little bit further, a little slice correction, that kind of stuff. And to go with it is one of those. You guys haven't seen one of these for a while. All right, a Mac Daddy CB, i.e. cavity back, right? And it's a 56 degree. Now this has all kinds of help with it. So if you're playing with a, if you're playing in a place that's very lush, very, uh, or you're a big divot taker, or you're playing in a place that has very fluffy sand, this thing's a really easy thing to swing and hit. It really, really is. And we put the uh, KBS High Rev 80 in it. That's what comes stock. Now, this is a half an inch over standard, but we ended up putting Jumbo Max on them. Now, Jumbo Max is not not a, a uh, aftermarket or a stock item. So that's something that we do here in-house. So we get them on. And this is this is the small medium or yeah the small medium which is bigger than the most of the the jumbo sets. <laughs> and he also got a uh, he got an Epic Speed Driver, which has been very very popular uh, as of late with the uh, Cipher shaft in it. Although if you're looking to kill some spin, uh, the my favorite is now the Max LS and use the smoke shaft. And it's not nearly as brutal as one would think. So it, don't be afraid to give it a try, particularly in the regular flex. They have a uh, 50 grammer, and I'm telling you what, knocks down around 800 RPM like right now. So if you're, look, if you're a spinner of the ball, that's something to look at. Okay, so what's in my drawers? What's in my drawers? I found this. All right, PCS... So PCS stands for Professional Club Making Society, Professional Club Maker Society. And it was based out of Louisville, Kentucky, and there was a lot of folks in it when I joined. And they put out a magazine, all right, 2005, right? And this is January 2005, so it's been some time. And it was a, uh, this was an, a sneak peek to their expo, and their, that, that was their expo that they held at the Galt House there in Louisville, and it was virtually, if you think of a PGA show strictly for club guys, this is where it was at, and it was happening. It was jam-packed, and it was a very large area, and it was always filled with somebody, and it was very, and it was very well attended on both the vendors and the people that showed up. Now, you could stay at the Galt House, which made it extraordinarily convenient. You just walk downstairs and away you go. 
or you could travel in. And there was a lot to do around the outside there. One of the things, Louisville uh, Slugger, where they made the bats. That was it. So uh, to kind of kind of date this, so that you, that you guys remember it, we had advertisement. The V2. <laughs> the V2, right? And so you guys don't think I'm pulling your leg. Let's see, I should have marked it, I suppose. Uh, see if I can get to it really quickly here. That's fitting on high tech. And there's a lot of good information talking about being on a tour van, uh, doing high tech fittings. Um, there's uh, another gal in here that was from uh, Cheshire. Is it Cheshire? Chel no, Cheltenham, uh, UK. And the Cheltenham, UK, she was extraordinarily good. Her name is Rini Cleaver. And uh, she's in here talking about loft lies. Uh, moment of inertia even back then. It was pretty good. Oh, here we go. And just so you guys, when I tell you guys I was part of it, Voila. Yeah, right? I was the educational director. <laughs> I was an educational director back then for them and uh, went for a couple of years. So it was uh, a lot of fun, very interesting, learned a lot of new ways of doing stuff. And that was uh, what we wanted to know. Now, back to who won and who didn't win. Uh, a RBC Heritage, the, the golf was alive with Stuart Sink winning at minus 19. Coming in second, uh, Emilio, Emiliano, yeah, Emiliano uh, Grillo and, and Harold Varner III tied for second at minus 15. Harold apparently came on at minus 5, and uh, where uh, Emilio, Emiliano, um, he just did the he did a minus, just, just, just did a minus three. And the guy that just above not making a cut is Sung Kang. Shot a plus six at a, uh, and sh ended up at a plus five. So not too bad, not too bad at all. All right, so going further, the Lot Championship, or Low T uh, Championship, L uh, Lydia Ko came in first at minus 28. Woo! Minus 28. Leona McGuire and then Kelly Norda came in that one. Here's one that was really odd. The Austrian Golf Open. Now, I'm not big, I don't, I won't profess to know a lot about Austria, but April seems like a very cold time frame. I didn't see anything, but it seemed awful cold. John Caitlin won at minus 14 and apparently was in a playoff with a Maximilian Kiefer. And then Martin Keimer was in third. So there's a name. We're not done yet. On the Corn Ferry, the MGM Resorts Championship, uh, Peter Uline. These are some names that you should hear that you should know. Peter Uline won at minus 16. Uh, David Lipsky came in second at uh, minus 12 and tied Jamie Lovemark. And Lovemark shot an even where Lipsky shot a minus seven. So there's some names out there. So it's a very competitive sets of tours. Uh, the Chubb Classic, <laughs> Chubb Classic, that's the Champions Tour. Steve Schricker, he took one home at minus 16, followed by Alex Yeka and Robert Carlson at minus 15. And then uh, we have the, we're going to go a little bit further, the Western Intercollegiate, uh, Intercollegiate match. And Pepperdine came in first. Stanford second and San Diego State, and the totals are not very impressive. Minus four, plus seven, and plus 20. So there we go. So golf is fully underway, right? Fully, fully underway. So now for me to, so going back to the, going back to the magazine and being the education director, I get asked a lot about how, you know, what do I do? How do I learn more about this kind of stuff? And education is the way to do it. Unfortunately, a lot of the schools are falling to the wayside because the businesses are, are go out. But uh, a stalwart group is Golf Works. They have a, a, series of, a series of schools that are certainly there. 
Um, there are other there are other means of learning where you can, if you're more of a hands-on book reading kind of guy, that you can. Uh, they have books out there, and there's Wishon's got a book, Maltby's got a book, um, and they all talk about club making, club fitting. And you can get some older ones out there if you go back as far as Dynacraft or even Maltby's old red book. And that's the club making Bible is what most people call it. Certainly would recommend those. All right. Now, also, there are some organizations to join. One of which I'm a member is the ICG, the International Club Makers Society, or Guild, sorry. International Club Makers Guild, which is kind of morphed into International Club Fitters Guild because it's more appropriate today than it is anything else. And it is very much international. There's a lot of folks from the Asian Rim in the UK, in the US. I mean, there's just a lot of folks in this. And there is a testing phase in that. And the testing phase involves going through a lot of the video, right? A lot of the videos that they have, because there's a lot of videos in there. And then finding these books and then using them as an open re resource in order to be able to take a test. And I have found that when you have to take the test and you have to actually go look up these answers, you really, really learn a lot, all right? You learn a lot. The physical part might be a little different, but we're, we're talking about raising a skill to a professional level. So it should not be a joke, and, and that's what they're doing. The other one is the AGCP, and for the life of me, I can't remember what it all stands for, but... GC, you can imagine as golf clubbers or golf fitter, golf club fitters or something along that lines. Another good group of folks, and they're ones that uh, the predominant amount of them are folks that are in business. And those are the two big ones that I'm aware of. So that's me by the last bit of it. Also, if you look behind me, right, I changed. It's the other side of the room. <laughs> it's the other side of the room. This is the TV that we see a lot of our shots on except for now that way is the net and the projector has been working really really good i've been it's not as bright as i would like it to be but if i kill the backlight it's very good uh, but then it gets dark on me so i do have a light coming in this way and you can see right and it's very nice outside oh by the way i don't know if you guys if in the united states but wednesday we're supposed to get snow 60 degrees all week long, but one day we're supposed to get snow. Go figure. So anyway, that's what we're doing. So above me, back here, is the uh, 18th hole at St. Andrews. Okay, 18th at St. Andrews. And, try to look. Uh, if we look at the, let me go, i got to read it. Oh, the Russics. We got it because the Russics is right about there. And we stayed there. Very nice. Very nice indeed. And uh, we got that as part of, we as we stayed, you go you go up and around a corner and there's a big uh, St. Andrew's tchotchke shop and you can't help but walk out with a bunch of it if you're from the U.S. Uh, down here, whoop, down here, I got some, I got recognized by the, uh, Congress of Ohio for being in business for a while, so not too bad. And uh, that was very pleasant, and I've got two more of those, too. And then this guy, there we go, that guy is a, uh, I got it. oh, yeah, is a, is a Norman Rockwell. So we have some pretty neat stuff in the area. Okay, so we've talked about fittings, we've talked about all, oh, one other thing. Again, here's a little self thing, self promotion. We still have the aprons. We still have we still have aprons with the McGolf logo on it. I know some of you guys have purchased them. Uh, U.S. made, U.S. built, the whole nine yards. Uh, we have two different sizes. If you uh, give Mrs. McGolf a shout out at, at uh, McGolf Shop at Clubmaker, or I'm sorry, McGolf Shop at Roadrunner.com, she'll be able to help you out. We'll put it in an envelope and make it as least expensive as possible to get to you. The other side is, as I showed you guys just or last week, is the club glove towels are now available in multi-colors. So, again, if you're interested in one of those, just let us know. All righty. So there's all this stuff. So let's go find out what we're, what we're going to talk about today. At the very top, 
Henry, what do you say, man? When epoxy sets, should it be the consistency of Jolly Rancher candy or caramel? Uh, I use the two-part epoxy and never set to brittle. Well, Jolly Rancher candy would be fine, all right? Jolly Rancher candy's hard. Sometimes it's a little sticky on the outside. You can get away with that, but you want it to be hard. If it is like caramel, uh, not enough hardener, and it's time to take it apart and make that happen. That's the reason why if you go to some of the videos that I do in club making, I make a special point to hold the hold up the little piece of cardboard that I've got it on and I go tick 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 to make it uh, to make sure that it is hard and it is and it has cured. And you know, keeping in mind that most two-part epoxies the final cure is 24 hours. All right, you can work it which they call a gel time and then there's the cure time or harden time and then a cure time. And 24 hours is typical for most two parts. Mr. Kent, what do you say, sir? Guess what, we're back to playing golf. The weather is great, our booking system appears to be working, so what happens? We get maintenance to work on the greens. <laughs> All the time, right? It just, just never stops. You would think that maybe they would have given a little bit of leeway in order to be prepared for you guys. Phil, how are you, sir? I have, thanks to our buddy Charles, I have some, I don't know if you were here the last time, but I have some 14 year, uh, 14 year, and I have it in my Edinburgh Cup, so we're good to go there. Yes, and Sink really put it on him in that one round, didn't he? He didn't, no mess. I like that. I like that, and he's won twice this year, so he's really found something. He's whatever he lost, he found it, and good for him. Okay, Danny Johnson. How often do you recommend buying new wedges? Play two to three times a week. By the way, snow is forecast in northeast Missouri tomorrow. Well, you're a day ahead of us, so yeah, that makes sense. So the uh, when doing wedges, all right, when doing wedges. If you're playing two to three times a week and you're playing very, very steady, and I mean nine months out of the year, right? Let's study nine months out of the year. If you're playing a forged wedge or a wedge that has a lot of surface coarseness on it, then I would suggest you check them at the end of each year. And I would say the wedges themselves, you could probably get away with two solid years easy. I mean, two solid years easy. However, I would check the lofts and lies probably every six months, maybe on a uh, on a forge club, on a cast club, which again most wedges are anymore. Uh, I would check it about once a year, and just make sure because uh, peace of mind is worth the four or five dollars that it costs to check it, and and then okay because most of these guys. Uh, most of those guys are cast, right? There's very few forged wedges out there. There are some, but not very many. These guys are in the majority. Now, not necessarily that with this, with that crazy face it's got on it. So I would, uh, but about every other year, you might actually, depending, and again, it also depends on if, if your soil is very sandy, like on a coastal community, uh, where it will, it will eat up it'll eat up a lot faster versus being in the black soil where you're at in Missouri. And so you might get away with it even longer, but somewhere in that two to three years. Ronald, for a beginning golfer, would you steer them into a heavy putter? What swing weight do you consider heavy? Uh, Ronald, not necessarily. Uh, a, a heavy putter, I mean, a heavy putter can work, but even for a beginner golfer, I get where you're going with this. As a heavy putter, it calms you down, it slows you down, and it makes for an even a more even stroke. And that's true, right? And you can go that way. And I don't really worry about swing weight so much as I do total weight because you can get these putters super duper heavy and their swing weight won't be a thing. So you want to be real careful with that, that but a total weight is important. Now, what I would consider, what I would, for a beginning golfer, what I would consider more right off the top of the, off the head is make it the right length so they have the proper stance to the ball so they can see the line or some semblance of the line. 
Then from there, making sure the lie angle is correct so that the putter doesn't, you know, like that, so that it's actually aimed where you want it to be. And those would be the two biggies. And then if you had that option, then I would look at the style of putter to make sure it's working for you. Those are, for me, those are the big three. And since we're talking about that, uh, directly after we're done, I have a, pit, a putter fitting for a young man that I had to uh, hold off a couple of days. So we, we're doing it after this. So I'm going to walk out of here and go right into a putter fitting. Oh, and if you notice right here, watch this. Zoom. That's my flight scope. I'm working on the, I'm working on the iPad. And it just kind of moves around. Isn't that cool? And you can get up and around in here. And I've only got two wedge shots on it just to take it, but I thought it was kind of a neat idea. It's got a lot of information on it. All right. Jack! Lumbar, it's no forecasted for tomorrow. I know, right? I'm kind of hoping that it's, it's one of those things that's probably going to flurry for about an hour and then turn around and die. And that's what I hope. And that's what I hope sincerely. Look at Charles talking to Robin. Thank you, sir, yet again. We're still on it. I got one more left. Okay. Well, you know, Kent and, Kent and Phil, I'm glad that you've made it. I know that you guys are up late watching this, and I'm certainly glad that you guys can get out, too. That's very good. I'd like to, I'd like to see that. I'm glad you guys are coming back. John, hi from Pinehurst. How are you, sir? I'm trying to convince my buddy to go on a on a visit down there, but the wives normally like being out on the on the shoreline, and that's going to be kind of a tough sell. Kicking back and relaxing is always good, but uh, it might be a tough sell. All right, Matt, there he is. So out of 73, only around in the week. Kids had soccer. Hey, it's important, man. Family's there. Favorite part about fitting, building, or fi what's your favorite part about a fitting, building, and fixing a club? Well, that's three questions, so you got a three for going. All right, favorite part about fitting. My favorite part about fitting is watching people do better after I bust a bunch of myths, right? And everybody comes in with a preconceived notion, that even though they have the Hey, you know, I, they'll say, well, I really don't like this style of club. Okay. And, or I don't like lightweight shafts. Okay. Or I have to have a particular kind of club. Or I thought this, you know, just certain, certain things that showed up uh, that they've accumulated in their golfing history. Okay. And we, as we go through the testing process, watching their eyes open as I bust these myths of, of, you know, oh, a half an inch doesn't make that much. And all of a sudden, they because they've gone one from the other, they're now 15 yards longer because they're finding the middle of the face just because of a half of an inch. Crazy. That's the part I like about it. And then, and then that allows me to work better to find the right stuff so that they golf better. And that's really what it's about, helping folks golf better. Building, I like building. I like building the, I like making sure, what I like building is, is the the finish work there's a lot of upfront work to be sure and the reason why i like the finish work is because i know i've already put all the upfront work in it and i know that i'm sitting where i want it to be but now i need to make it look good <laughs> and just like the feral thing i'm a big feral nazi guy and and i just like it looking good so that when whoever purchases this stuff goes wow that's a really cool looking club and that imparts a little bit of confidence so that there's a little more acceptance and a little bit more enjoyment in golf, yet again, enjoying golf. And then fixing a club. I've never been, you know, the thing is, I've never been much of a troubleshooter when it came to other stuff, but uh, figuring out how to take these things apart has really been a lot, of, uh, a lot of fun and learning some new stuff because I get some crazy old stuff in here. And then you get to see some of the new stuff. I would have never, like PXG stuff, I would have never, ever seen PXG stuff had somebody not brought it into me. And I get to see that kind of stuff. So that's always fun. Patrick, hello again. How are you, sir? I do dig on the emblem, man.
Charles, love the golf towel. I got the gray one, used it twice, wiped off a lot of dirt and mud. <laughs> All right, well, there you go. These things really are kind of cool. They, uh, uh, you know, they're kind of aggressive. And the, the best part is, is, and the reason why I like them so well is because of their aggressiveness. And they're the ones that you see out on the tour. And you don't see too many golf brushes where a guy's doing like this on there. There are guys normally wiping it off. And that's what that's for. And that's what I like. It, it helps preserve the face. So, yeah. And they do last quite some time. I mean, I've got two green ones. And I bet I've washed one of them gobs more times than I want to count because of all the mud I've taken off of my own clubs. And it's just a hair of a shade different. So it, it will take... It will take a pounding. All right. Travis Kemp, and he is from Facebook. Have you ever taken lessons for playing, or are you self-taught? Well, I will say that I have, I have, you know, from local guys that were very, that were starting out, I took some lessons, but I'm not a very good lesson guy at that, at that stage of my life. However, this year... I, I can consider myself taking a lesson from somebody who who makes a full-on living at doing it. And his name is Mike Malaska. And I don't mind telling you, he's on YouTube as well. Uh, good guy, old school fella, has a lot of ideas that per, that may not be mainstream, and I'm okay with that. And he, he and I talked for a good hour or more, and one of those things where you just hit it off with somebody, and that's the reason why... I, I give this guy a you know big thumbs up, and of course I get to practice right here, and he gets to see me just like you guys do, and and we'll talk about it. And because of a lesson, uh, I do believe my ball striking's gotten better. And I, you know everybody's like, oh, you get a lesson, you hit it further. Well, not necessarily, but man, do I hit it better. And hitting it better is what it's all about, right? I because you know. For me, I hit it plenty far. Am I like on TV? Not even close. But when I play around here or go traveling, you know, I don't get overpowered by too many golf courses. And but being able to hit it and know that it's doing these things I want it to do is all the dividend. So yeah, uh, certainly that's what it is. But outside of that, no. But yeah, Mike Malaska, I'd look him up. All righty. There's Dave, fellow lefty from Michigan. How are you, sir? There's Joe. Where'd you go this time, buddy? Thought I'd miss you, but just got back from Moline, Illinois. Doggone planes. <laughs> Joe is a guy that goes around, and that's his job. He flies out where they tell him, and he fixes the planes. Sometimes full-on engine repairs to simple fixes to get him going. So there you go. Uh, got new questions. I'm noticing that I am a club short on my new clubs. Is this a learning curve or with new clubs? Uh, I don't know. It depends. Uh, I know that we made the clubs a little shorter for you. And so what you might want to do is take a look at resetting yourself for your stance, Joe. And then that might get you where you need to be. And the fact that the clubs haven't, you know, it hasn't been a weather that if you're comparing summertime to now, because it's been 40 degrees versus 80, that could be your club right there. So either temperature or reset. Man, Charles is my, he's my guy right now. Look at that. All right. The big gal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Bought an AD Tour D7X shaft. Holy smokes. Okay. From a buy, sell, and trade site. When I removed the grip to put a new grip on, I noticed it had been extended badly. Oh. I'm guessing it's a three wood extension out. Ouch. That can't be good. So, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Uh. If it depends on how much it's been extended. If it's only an inch, maybe an inch and a half, I wouldn't sweat it so much. 
play and see what happens. It might be very, might be the very thing that you're looking for. Now, is it exactly the same? No, obviously, because it's got an extension in it. However, and it depends on which one too. If you've got, if it's a black extension, the the plasti type, that's more in line with what was in it. If it's the steel one, I would switch it out almost immediately because the steel will turn into a saw and cut some of the back end off of it. So I would change that out. Now the thing that scares me, if this is a three wood and it is a driver shaft, that it's been tipped to a driver shaft or tipped to a three wood and now your D7X is probably playing more like a D7 or a DI7XX flex. So you want to be careful about that too. Cartersville, Georgia. How are you, Joey? Thank you for coming on. There's my buddy, Christer. How you doing? I'm hoping that everything's melted down for you by now. Oh, and Joey's coming up from Cartersville for a, for a fitting in May. That's why I just found out. So, Joey, be careful coming up, man. The V2, there's Bordy Shaft. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And you know what? The thing was, the V2, that was the predecessor of the of the Pro Force, the regular Pro Force. That's all it was, Pro Force. And it was the, the what they called the gold shaft. The gold, purple and gold shaft. That's it. Purple and gold. I do have a story for that one. The So the purple and gold shaft was all the rage. And I was in the business for a while. And I had an opportunity to be on a tour van. And the, and the tour van was at the NEC in Akron, Ohio. So I went all the way up there. And the the I was in the rifle trailer. And the... the uh, UST guy and the and the rifle they all are all kind of in one spot and they were just coming out with the with the red and gold shaft and it was called the uh, Pro Force uh, Pro Force something it was accelerated tip and these guys took it out didn't have any labeling on it all it had was a color took it out absolutely loved it all these pros absolutely loved it hitting it a mile they said loved it to death okay and and they said well what's it going to be called well it's going to be the pro force it was at i think it was accelerated tip what's that mean well it's a little more flexible tip Oop. can't have it can't have it can't have a flexible tip but you said you just hit it a mile it was okay sorry can't have it so it just goes to show you that they, even on the Pro Tour, there there are still these preconceived notions. John, how are you doing, Bert, sir? And Ash, see, up the road, Ashland. Oh, okay, good. Okay to stop in and say hello sometime. Well, sure, bud. Uh, if you're, you know, your best time is on the weekends or even uh, in the afternoons. In the mornings, not so much. If you're Looking for something, just give us a, give Robin a call and she'll tell you the best times. Ronald, tremendous respect for Jim, so smart, accomplished, great communicator. <laughs> Ronald, thanks, bud. <laughs> Here we go. What adapter do I buy? I know other, well, I know the other butt size is 600. What would the inner diameter be I need to buy, please? Well, number one, it's not to sound awful, but it's for the, when you buy the adapter, it's going to be for the type of head. So if you need a ping, it's a ping adapter. If it's a Callaway, it's a Callaway adapter. If it's Titleist, it's Titleist. Tighter made, so on and so forth. And any more, they don't make in different diameter ones that I'm aware of. I'm trying to think. There might be a 350, but it'd be super duper old. But the tip, normal tip size on a on a driver shaft is 335, and that's what you're looking for. Okay. Can a driver shaft that feels soft make you hit the ball to the right? A 69 X flex with a torque that feels whippy. Get a 75 S flex with a torque. Okay, so gotta think right-handed here for a moment. Hit the ball to the right. Uh, yes, it can, but in this, in your particular, in your particular instance, so here, let's start over and I'll speak English again. 
if it is truly soft, Krister, if it's truly soft and you're very aggressive, which you are, and the shaft is in the shaft is actually soft, you can torque it to the open. All right, you can torque it to the open. That is not normally what happens. We'll bu we'll bust a myth right here. So you'll get these guys that hit this slice and they go, "Oh, I'm just swinging so hard that I'm keeping the face open." Not. All right, not even close. There's very it's a very rare item that somebody does that. Now, if this guy is in his 20s and he's carrying his sister's clubs, then yeah, maybe. Uh, but it's a rare animal that that's really what's going on. Uh, in your particular instance, uh, three point because I know you're extraordinarily aggressive. Uh, the three one because three two is what I would call average, right? Average to just a little bit lower than average torque, meaning that a little bit more of this is going on, and and it might cause that. All right, it just very well might cause that. Uh, but the, but in X flex, man, I, and if it's been trimmed, I don't know. I, the X of core has got all that weave and I don't see that being that issue. Um, but it could be the, it could be the weight, right? You've been playing around with stuff in the seventies the and it could be the weight and you're just losing it. Mr. Sloan. From West Virginia, how are you, sir? Brian, what do you say, bud? You're back in Alberta after six months in Arizona. Oh, I bet that was a bit of a change. And I have to quarantine my home for two weeks in spite of my two negative COVID tests. Uh, well, I think I think what we're starting to see, and though, though uh, is there's going to be a lot, of, when it's all said and done, there's going to be a lot of questions to answer once all the data has been thrown out there. You know, I am sure that they're, the governments are doing what they think are right for us, but every once in a while it's not. It's okay to question, just don't get rowdy about doing it. Uh, but about a practice net, good for you, man. Is it, Are you out in the garage doing that or are you inside? May, you you, you got to watch out, Brian. This thing turns into a hobby. Or into a habit. Next thing you know, you have a uh, a homemade simulator. <laughs> so watch out. <laughs> or should I be telling the wife that? All right, James Hammond, Indiana, checking in. Well, how you doing? Three inches of snow. Good gravy, man. Where are you at? Are you in the northern area? That's a lot of snow. Well, you could get lake effect if you're up north. If you're in the Plymouth or even. You know, up in the even closer to Chicago, you could do that. Three inches of snow. Well, I hope the sixty the sixty degree weather comes right back and melts the whole thing right down for you. All right, Patrick graduated from Kaiser University, West Palm Beach, through the College of Golf. Nice. Going to build my own teaching and building business. Definitely, but good for you. Mitchell Golf certification in and equipment is great. Mitchell stuff is very good, I will have to say. I am a full believer in their loft and lie machines. Uh, their, their frequency machine, I like the, I'm not a fan of the clamp. Well, I, I'm a fan of the clamp to an extent. It's a, it, it, uh, I like where you can clamp it on your own and put your own torque to it. Unless they've changed it, it used to have a lever clamp and it was just at a given pressure. And with the lightweight ones, you can really smash the back end, and I didn't like that. Uh, but the rest of it was pretty good. The guys there, I talked to a, a gentleman named Patrick, and the vice president or something. Uh, very outgoing, very good guy. I, I just think he, they'll be doing much better nowadays. That's what I'm thinking, Mike. Hey, there's Adam. How are you, sir? <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I could click on that that logo of yours. Hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, for all those you don't know, and you probably don't, let's see if I, it won't work. Adam is seven foot tall, and I just did a fitting with him. He is seven foot tall. And he is, he is just starting 
his career in a in the field that I left, <laughs> and uh, and I, I hope the best for him. And uh, and it, it you've never seen such an easy swing produce so much speed in your life. He does very very well. We're we're getting your stuff ordered, man. James Hammond. <laughs> Who's your hospitality? That's a fact, bud. We're in at we're at in Indiana. Same here. Two inches of snow Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. Good night. Where is this stuff coming from? South Carolina played every week since March fifteenth. Ronald, I am completely jealous. Man, we got all kinds of stuff here. I went down to the bottom again. All righty. Mike, make a nine-hour drive to South Bend in November to try and watch my fight in Irish beat Georgia Tech. I don't want snow there either. Unfortunately, Mike, chances are in November in South Bend, odds are against you, bud. South Bend. Oh, it's been ages since I've been up there. Al Burnett, what do you say? Thank you, Rob, for outstanding job on the D9s. Oh, that's right. Anyone who says that spining and peering sirens are totally wrong. <laughs> we sent a set of the D9s out to Mr. Al at Space Coast. I'm glad that you like them, buddy. I believe we used, uh, what did we use? Did we use the Nippins? It's going close. I'm, they're mixing together. But I'm glad you like them, Al. Glad, really glad that you like them. Oh, well, good. He received his apron. That's very good. Well done. Upgraded my set to rad speed one lengths. Mixed feelings. Like the same length idea. Cost a little distance with the five and, five and six iron. So, Mike, that's, you know, that seems to be a, uh, you like the sunburn? So all those guys getting snow, see all that? That's from mowing four hours yesterday on the zero turnout on the range with the wife. And uh, and then taking care of my dad's yard. That's a lot of time outside. Oh, and washing and waxing the truck. I should have posted that up in here. <laughs> That's my other thing. Other than cooking, I like I like cleaning my car. Anyway, uh, five and six iron, Mike. So that's a common thread, okay? If you go out there and you talk to people, it's a common thread. And some can be attributed to the wrong shaft, but... What I have found out when I deal with the with the guys when we do these uh, single lengths is that when you get to the six iron, it's going to sound counterproductive, but relax, right? Relax. That doesn't mean slow down. It just means tension free, tension free. Because what happens is is going when you go from a traditional set to a single length set. It's already in your head that, wow, these things are shorter. i got to swing them harder to make them go. And no, you don't. All right? No, you don't. Slow down, relax, and have a, look, have a good day with them. And enjoy the rad speeds. There's Tim Bockhold. How you doing, bud? James, think about single-length irons due to back conditions. I'm worried about the 5 and 6 iron as well. Well, hopefully we address that. Now, I will say this. Uh, you guys saw me, I did the build, I did a single length build and I used the Pedersen shafts. Pedersen makes a specific single length shaft and they have some for the long irons, some for the mid irons, some for the short irons and they are different profiles. I think that's an awesome idea for single length. So they're all the same weight flex, they just have different profiles to help you with those particular things. It's very much like a flighted set in steel. And except except for their flighted sets are made for normal normal lengths, right? So this guy, there's a lot of engineering that goes into this shaft, and uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes into the shaft. I think it's well worth the effort to look into those because they have different flexes, and I believe there's a couple weight categories to check into. Now, it's not it's a more expensive shaft to be sure, but I think the payoff would be well worth it. We say, Al, outstanding job. Oh, I already did that one. Yep. There's Steven. How are you, sir? I'm 
Okay. Henry, the best way to get in contact with us is McGolfShop at Roadrunner.com. McGolfShop at Roadrunner.com, and Robin or I will help you out. Ray's on Facebook, and he's in there from sunny SoCal at 84 degrees. And Ray's not going to get any snow like we are. Well done, sir. Well done. Yes, I am. That is very, is, you know, and they, a lot of scotch, is a, they'll say, is an acquired taste. And it is. And now that I've been doing this long enough, particularly after visiting Scotland and getting educated even more on it, uh, there is something to be said about that. Will the shafts in my D9s fit into my 410s? They should. They should. And if not, I can make them. <laughs> Peter, seven, eight rounds near Syracuse so far. Not a bad start. Or this time of year. I would say so. Up in Syracuse, that's not, you know, there's been an, there's another kid out there that's been, uh, that's been playing in that neck of the woods near Buffalo. Hey, hey, hey. So, uh, good. I'm glad you're getting in there. Do I recommend regrooving irons to get the spin back? Only if you're in love with the iron. All right? Only if you're in love with the iron. And if you do, take it to somebody that's going to do it the right way, not with one of those little groove tools that you push like a screwdriver. The reason why I say that is because the groove rules, if you go to regroove and use that tool, there's a very, very, very good chance you will make them illegal. Now, if you're not playing in those types of tournaments, then by all means, go grab that tool and have at it. But if you're you know, going to be playing in something like that, you want to be very, very careful about that and uh, send them to an iron reworker of some sort and let them do it. If not, then, and the cost of regrooving could be uh, preventative. I mean, it's going to be less than a set of clubs to be sure. However, uh, the result, it may not be what you're looking for and you've been better off just to buy it. So it's kind of one of those up to you, but there are ways of getting it done. My opinion, Emanuel, oh man, I'm not going to say it. Uh, KZG. I used to carry KZG. Uh, I like them. Uh, they they had a a truckload of offerings in the iron category, and they always had one or two drivers. I don't know where it's at now, and always one of the two were actually worked really well. The other one not so much. Uh, they had a couple of wedges that were pretty good. Uh, but overall, I mean, it, it, they do a pretty good job as far as that goes. It's all about how they're put together. And if you can find the right one, they do, and they do pretty good with a, uh, with a combo set as well. That's my wife answering. Get down here. What's the shortest I'd cut down a set of irons? Uh, well, it depends, again, like everything in golf, it depends, right? Uh, just as a, hey, can you cut this down? Personally, without knowing anything about a person, the max I'd go is an inch. Because after an inch, I, I take a different way of cutting down the irons in order for the, order for the pitching wedge not to play like something that came out of romper room or play school for that matter. And you got to cut them down differently, and that's. But I wouldn't go any more than an inch. If you're a, a very, very short person, an inch might be where you want to go. But I'd be really careful. I wouldn't go much past that. Now, if you're doing it for kids, so the reason why, so on, on the butt end of every shaft, there's a, so much of a butt section, and you can easily get into like this much left of the butt section, of which the club won't play like it's supposed to anymore. And that's the reason why I get really kind of nervous, because normally you get a section uh, about like that, right, about ASO, and if you cut it off an inch, it's not too bad. 
But outside of that, the, the club doesn't necessarily keep its playing characteristics. I'm a Mike Malaska member. He's the best by far. I've learned more in two years from him. Yes, right? I, James, I just think he, I think he does a very, very fine job. He does. There's Dave. What do you say, man? If your irons fit you well at C9D0, what swing rate range is likely to fit the driver? Thanks. Uh, you know, in the day, it used to be that the driver was lighter. All right. So if you had a a D2 dry, a D2 iron a D0 driver, I would look at if you're at the C9 D0, honestly, I wouldn't be afraid to be in that same category, but if it was a little bit lighter, I wouldn't it wouldn't bother me either. Okay. Uh cuz the it, it's a different makeup, right? It's just a different makeup and the swing weight out of a driver can be made up in length whereas the swing weight in irons can be made up in weight and along with everything else so what i would look really look hard at is i wouldn't i wouldn't go too many swing weight points either way of that one all right because you don't want to just go well i must need c8 because c9 d0 works for me it's not the case uh what you really want to look at is the total weight again we're watching the total weight but and if it comes out c7 or c8 then okay if it comes out d0 d1 again okay and then keeping it that there's aaron back from his hawaiian trip <laughs> have I ever built hickory shafted clubs before i can't say that i have i've not like i've not built a set i have worked on them and I've done a lot with the, uh, you know, that whipping that goes around, it's pitch. And which pitch is a string that's been dipped in tar, basically, and it's on a spool, which I've, for some good night reason, I've got one. And I've done some of, some of that work, and I've also done some re-gripping. And, and re-gripping is, is basically uh, taking a, nail, a couple nails out of the back and it had a, ca a silver cap on it, and then un unwiring or unrolling the the uh, the leather strap, and then taking out that other nail or and the whipping, and then another nail and pulling it off. Now, in some cases, if it's not real bad, you can save that and hit it with what they called saddle soap for back in the day, and it would make it make this stuff respond. And you let it dry, and you could put it right back on, and then re-whip it and recap it, and away you go. Or you found yourself another piece of leather which down the street was an old, he's not there anymore, but he was an old belt maker, leather worker, and you could go buy a strap of that, and then you'd have to cut off the angles and put it together. But as far as actually taking one apart and putting one back together, no. Now, down the road in Portsmouth, there was a guy, that was all he did was uh, he did those hickory-shafted uh, golf tournaments where you would wear outfits from the period and they would give you sets of clubs and you would go out and you would play and eventually in one of those sets he did he was replacing clubs because somebody would snap a shaft and he would show me what he would do i knew how to do it but i just never had to, had the opportunity love the look at address of the new apex 21 yes yes they are presently playing the hot metal mizuno can you give a comparison between the dcb and the apex 21 for mid handicapper age six <laughs> okay woo wee and as a mid handicapper age six hitting the seven iron 155 yards wow okay 61. Mm. Apparently a little further down at 61. <laughs> All right, so the Apex, the Apex and the DCB are, are made very much, the construction is pretty much about the same. The design, however, is different in that you have uh, less offset on the Apex than you do the DCB. The sole width on the DCB is a little bit wider and has a little bit more curvature in the back than the straight up and down version of the Apex. And virtually that's the difference. And it, I don't recall, but it might actually be like one degree stronger. 
So the, the real thing is if you're fighting a slice and you just can't get the club closed, then the DCB is the way to go. If you're pretty much in control of your ball flight and you just you like the look of it and you can deal with uh, a little less offset, then I would go with the Apex 21. And you can go with that. Now if you're really at the mid handicapper and you're talking to you, you've got good ball striking, they have, they have what you can do in combo setting. So you can start out at uh, the Apex 21 and at the bottom end use the pros and then they bend them so that they're more in line. That's always something else to consider. Donald, my new pink 425s came in swing with D6. Woo, wedges nine, D9, ordered them one inch over. They said they can't swing weight them. What can I do? Well, uh, one inch over, it's always going to be, uh, there's ways to trick it, Donald. And what you can do is you can put in a lighter shaft at one inch over and that will bring it down. It won't bring it down a lot, but it should bring it down. The other part of it is, is whether or not you're, you know, if you need an inch over, we're gonna assume you're a pretty big guy and pretty big hands. And if you have pretty big hands at an inch over, then you have a bigger grip and that weighs more and it should bring it down somewhat as well. And it sounds like they may have gone there at D6 because if you're at, let's say it's D0, or even D2, and you add an inch, that's six, so you're around D8. Eh, they probably could have done a little something, and, and they can do that. But that's that's a lot of the changes. Now, I find with, with ping, they swing weight with using that badge that's on the back. And they should have been searching out the lightest heads they can and putting like a zero weight on the back of the badge. That would be my guess. I don't know. Uh... But that's where that would be. There it is, 61. And then there's Ronald Varberg. Well, there you go. Maybe, Ronald, you guys got something to talk about. We say, man. Okay. Ooh, okay. Well, hopefully it works out. All right, let's go. Oop, got to go back to the top. I went to the bottom again for some reason. James is in Indianapolis. All right. We got some friends around there in Carmel. Carmel, Carmel, right out by the lake. We lived about an hour north. Oh, I'm going to close that. Got a low battery signal. All right. What's the lesser of two evils? A putter that's too short or too long? Uh, too long. Because you can't choke up. Choking down, you can get away with. Choking up, not so much. Sunny, cold. Hornsey, UK. Great to be back on the course. Played to 12 with a jumbo max ultralight grips. Not bad for a 19. There you go, buddy. Well done, sir. I like, I'm telling you, those jumbo grips, there's something to be said for those. We got Lincoln Talk with Bill and Jacques. COVID report from Ontario golf courses are shut down till May 20th. Holy cow, dude. I'd be traveling if I was you. I don't know exactly if, if it's just relegated to the different... Uh, different areas of Canada or not, or if it's just there. Not yet, Henry, not yet. Uh, we are working with Nippon and the Reggio. Uh, I don't have a whole lot on the driver stuff yet. I'm still, I've wrapped my head around the, the, uh, the iron line because the Mod you know, Modus is easy, the the 950 series, the GH series is easy. It's when they get lightweight. These guys have a 750 gram steel shaft, and it's kind of got a weave in it, and and it's something else, but you got I, those are the things I got to pay attention to, and that's what I'm working on. Just got a jumbo super stroke. There you go. Camelio, how are you, dude? 
Big thumbs up. No rounds for for me. COVID is harassing around here. Ah, damn. Even it's everywhere, man. It is everywhere. There you go. That's what Chris has got. Mid jumbo grip, lighter weight field. Pretty, pretty good. Very good. Chad Lewis, 15 rounds in Kokomo. Can't get my distance back to where it was last year. Love golfing regardless. Well, Chad, hopefully there wasn't anything that caused you to lose it, you know. Uh, but, it, and it's still early, dude. I mean, even up there, it's it's early, okay. And uh, I'm sure it will come back when the weather, I mean, there's a lot to be said for temperature. Golf balls, when it starts getting in the 40, you can expect for it to not fly nearly as far. So, Kokomo, well done. I did my high school years in Logansport. <laughs> Sunny V, it's been a while. Lockdown Ontario. One of the only places where it's unsafe to golf. Sonny, I I I don't know what to say, dude. Because if I say too much, I probably this video would probably go the other way. But all I can say is I feel for you. I feel for you a bunch. Uh, and I wish that you guys could travel and go somewhere else and play just to follow the rules and still be safe. All right, Greg McIntosh, I'm waiting. I'm in the waiting stage for my Mizuno HMPs to show up. Have a great day. All right, HMBs, buddy. One length shafts. KB uses lighter weight shafts in the long irons. With Sean, shafts can either be soft stepped or hard stepped. Next flex down, lots of actions. Well, there you go, David. It must be doing quite a bit. All righty, guys. Like I said, I've got a lot. I've got a, a young man that I've got to fit, but we're going to get a couple more. Here we go. Clisby, John Clisby. Hi, South Australia. Great show. Well, thank you, John. Thank you for coming on. Uh, very good. Yep, we're going to get down here to the bottom. We'll get a couple of. Nope, Chad ran the admissions office in the community college. I actually went there when they very first opened. Let's just say I was not a very good student. <laughs> I'm hitting my club so long, what do I do? I guess enjoy it. Uh, hitting 210 7 iron. Dude, that's stout. That is extraordinarily stout. Uh,. Go to the black tips, <laughs> I guess. That's awesome. Glad to see it. The only other thing is if you like the if you don't like the trajectory and it seems a little low, weaken them up some. All right, let's get it here. Got two more. I'm gonna do. No, not a 750. A well, it, the the title is 750, but it's a 75 gram. That's what it is. Dwayne, you made it to Florida. Good for you, buddy. Hopefully you're all as well. I'm glad to see that you're down there. Stay safe. All right, last one. Thomas Struther. Hi, Jim. Any experience on reworking rusted wedges? Did a vinegar bath and rust removal with cough, with a coffee itch and thought to approach recommendations. Don't worry. Uh, it was an old King Cobra, Phil Rogers, 56. Huh. All right. Uh... That's a good way. I've also seen or heard of guys dipping it in Coca-Cola, just letting it sit in there for a while. But when you're done, you got to wipe it off, right? The other one is the, uh, have you seen those little nylon wheels? About yay wide. They look like scotch brights, but it's in a nylon wheel. Put it in a drill and run it up and down there. That'll really help you out. That just takes the rust off. Now, for for polishing, Using that same drill, you get an unstitched wheel and you put some uh, some rouge on it, and that'll help you go the other way. All righty. Well, guys and gals, thank you for watching, and we're all over the world again. And I just, I'm absolutely astounded by that. And again, uh, we're going to do this again next week. Hopefully, Ontario gets a little relief in that we see the the maintenance guys in the UK getting out of the way of the golfers since I'm sure that they just want to go bad, bad, bad. And and then all the rest of us can see that we got through our snow that we're supposed to be getting. Guys, uh, watch out for the next release. 
And as always, let's see your scores go low.